Hello. In chapter 1, you were introduced to the concept of homeostasis in which variables such as the concentrations of many chemicals in the blood are maintained within a normal range. To fully appreciate the mechanisms by which homeostasis is achieved, we must first understand the basic chemistry of the human body, including the key features of atoms and molecules that contribute to their ability to interact with one another. The discussion for today covers the basic chemistry of life, from the atoms to the large organic macromolecules that constitute the human body. As we do this, we will skim through some basic chemical concepts that are important to understand as well in our journey to understand the workings of the human body. The units of matter that form all chemical substances are called atoms. Each type of atom is also called element. The chemical properties of atoms can be described in terms of three subatomic particles, namely protons that are positively charged, neutrons that are not charged, and then electrons that are negatively charged. The protons and neutrons are confined to a very small volume at the center of the atom, which we call nucleus. The electrons, on the other hand, revolve in orbitals at various distances from the nucleus. The first innermost shell of any atom can hold up to two electrons in a single spherical S orbital, as shown here in this dumbbell-shaped model. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. The first two electrons fill a spherical S orbital, and the subsequent electrons in the dumbbell-shaped model are fill up a propeller-shaped or P orbitals. An atom is most stable when all the orbitals in the outermost shell are filled with two electrons each. If one or more orbitals, especially the outer orbitals, do not have their full capacity of electrons, the atom can react with other atoms and form molecules. The electrons on the outermost orbital are often called valence electrons. It is these valence electrons that actually determine the reactivity of atoms. Each atom or element contains a specific number of protons, and it is this number of protons that uh, distinguishes one type of atom from another. This is called the atomic number. The atomic mass, on the other hand, refers to approximately to the number of protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus. Uh, by, by convention, it is also measured relative to the atomic mass of carbon. Like for example, if hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1, it means that its mass is one-twelfth the mass of the carbon atom. Isotopes are atoms having identical number of protons but which differ in the number of neutrons they contain. So, for example, you have carbon-12 and carbon-14. Both carbon atoms have six uh, number of protons but their neutrons are different. Carbon-12 has 6 neutrons, whereas carbon-14 has 8 neutrons. So they are called isotopes. And isotopes usually are uh, very unstable molecules or other elements that easily break down and release energy by radiation. Isotopes are often useful as biological tracers when we want to determine the pathway of certain uh, elements we are interested in. Atoms may gain or lose electrons and when they do, they become ions. Atoms that lose electrons become cations. 
and become positively charged, while atoms that gain electrons become anions and therefore are negatively charged. Ions conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Consequently, the ionic forms of mineral elements are collectively referred to as electrolytes. The table shown here uh, lists the different types of elements that may be found in the human body and the percentage they occupy in the uh, body mass. Uh, there are 92 naturally occurring elements on Earth, but the human body requires only 25 of these elements. And only four elements actually occupies the largest or the bulk of the uh, body weight or body mass, namely oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The rest are required in small quantities as micro elements or micronutrients, and some are even required in very, very tiny amounts we call as trace elements. They are listed here below on the third level of the table. The forces that bind atoms together to form molecules is called chemical bond. There are three major chemical bonds that we can discuss here, although there are more, but these are the most important ones that form the molecules of the human body. This includes covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Covalent bonds occurs when two atoms share electrons. The sharing of electrons may either be unequal or equal. When you have an equal sharing of electrons, that is, one of the, ele the electrons is spending more time in one of the atoms than in the other, you have polar covalent bond. And what happens here is that um, one of the atom, one of the two atoms sharing electrons becomes slightly negatively charged and the other slightly positively charged. And because of this polarity, it causes the entire molecule to be reactive with oppositely charged atoms or molecules, like in hydroxyl groups, in sulfhydryl groups, and nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. In nonpolar covalent bonds, the atoms share electrons equally, like in this methane molecule. Carbon shares electrons with hydrogen atoms equally. It forms a very stable molecule, forming nonpolar covalent bonds. Uh, Carbon-hydrogen bonds and carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds are also examples of nonpolar covalent bond. There is no charge that is exhibited by these um, atoms sharing electrons in co nonpolar covalent bonds so that these parts of the molecule does not show any reactivity with other nearby atoms or molecules. <clears throat> in ionic bonding, two oppositely charged atoms or molecules bind together due to electrical attraction. The, a good example here is shown by this uh, sodium, crystal, sodium chloride crystal where sodium is electrostatically attracted to chlorine atoms and therefore forms the sodium chlorine, the sodium chloride um, crystal. Um, molecules that are bound in ionic bonds usually are very strong in dry environments, but when they are immersed in water, the molecules can easily break down because of the attractive forces of water molecules around them. The water molecules tug and pull on the uh, atoms formed by ionic bond, thereby dissolving the molecule. Like sodium chloride, for example, when you place it in water, 
it easily dissolves. This is due to the pulling and tugging uh, motion of the water molecules on the individual component atoms in sodium chloride. <clears throat> the third major kind of chemical bond that binds atoms together into molecules is the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond occurs when a hydrogen that is already covalently bonded with a strongly electronegative atom is attracted to another oppositely charged atom in a nearby molecule. So you have hydrogen bonds. And a very good example here for hydrogen bond is the force that binds the nitrogenous bases of nucleotides in DNA. Okay. DNA are uh, made up of two strands of nucleic acids that are intertwined around each other, forming a helical molecule. The component nucleotides are held together by sugar to phosphate bonding that forms the backbone, but the nitrogenous bases between two strands of nucleic acids are are bound to each other by hydrogen bond, forming a strong but easily detached um, bonding between the nucleotide bases of nucleic acids in DNA. When atoms are linked together, they form molecules with various shapes. Molecules are three-dimensional. When more than one covalent bond is formed with a given atom, the bonds are distributed around the atom in a pattern that may or may not be symmetrical. Molecules are not rigid, inflexible structures. Within certain limits, the shape of a molecule can be changed without breaking the covalent bonds, linking its atoms together. At room temperature, molecules rapidly bend, vibrate, and rotate. In the, model, in the model shown here of ethane, the hydrogen atoms are highlighted in red, blue, and white to help you keep track of their relative positions. These movements, which is actually in millions of times per second, have been greatly slowed down. Showing you this uh, movement of the component atoms. with their corresponding bonds that are also moving. Ionization can occur not only in single atoms, but also in covalently linked molecules. Two commonly encountered groups of atoms that undergo ionization are carboxyl and amino groups. The carboxyl group ionizes when the oxygen linked to the hydrogen captures the only electron to form the carboxyl ion, releasing a hydrogen ion, thereby making the molecule acidic. An, ionized, an amino group can also release its ion, its uh, hydrogen, and thereby forming an amino, ionized amino group. <clears throat> an atom or molecule containing a single unpaired electron in an orbital of its outer shell is known as a free radical. Free radicals are unstable molecules that can react with other atoms through the process known as oxidation. Free radicals are formed by certain enzymes such as when white blood cells destroy pathogens. Free radicals can be produced in the body following exposure to radiation or toxin ingestion. These free radicals can do considerable harm to the cells of the body. For, exam for example, Oxidation to, due to long-term buildup of free radicals has been proposed as one of the cause of several different human diseases, notably eye, cardiovascular, and neural diseases associated with aging. Free radicals are diagrammed with 
a dot next to the atomic symbol. Out of every 100 molecules in the human body, about 99 of these are water. Water molecules are very small molecules made up of strongly neg electronegative oxygen atom and two weakly electronegative hydrogen atoms. These differences of electronegativities causes the water molecule to have an equal sharing of electrons in their covalent bonds. This makes water molecules polar, that is, they exhibit negative and positive charges. When they lie close to each other, water molecules bind in hydrogen bond with nearby water molecules. The collective hydrogen bonding of water molecules in water creates considerable cohesiveness, in turn producing emergent properties that makes water a very important commodity of the human body and function. These physiologically significant properties of water include its high boiling point, specific heat, and chemical reactivity. Water stays liquid up to 100 degrees Celsius, and since the body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius, water stays liquid in the body. Even then, some water molecules leave the body as a gas water or water vapor. Each time when we exhale during breathing, the water loss in the form of water vapor has considerable importance for total body water homeostasis and must be replaced with water obtained from food or drink. When one gram of water is raised to one degree Celsius higher, water requires relative great energy called specific heat. This uh, sp value of specific heat of water, liquid water, is shown here in this table in joules per gram. Uh, liquid water has a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram. Other uh, substances like water vapor, ice, has a lower specific heat. Dry air has only 1.01. .01. Basalt has only 0.84. Iron has only 0.45, lead only has 0.13 for specific heat. So liquid water is a very high specific heat, therefore. Now, the property of specific heat in water enables water to help regulate body temperature in homeostasis. When the body is exposed to heat, the specific heat of water insulates us from too much heat. When they, when they evaporate, we lose lots of amounts of energy in the, in the vapor molecules of water. Molecules having a number of polar bonds and or ionized groups will dissolve in water. This is what we mean by molecular solubility. Molecular solubility depends on the charge properties or polarity of the molecule, especially its functional groups. Charged atoms or polar molecules makes it hydro hydrophilic or water-loving, interacting with water molecules in and outside the cells. If the molecule is uncharged or nonpolar, the molecule is said to be uh, water-fearing or hydrophobic and will not interact with water. Molecules that have both charged or polar and uncharged nonpolar parts are classified as amphipathic molecules. Now, solute concentration is defined as the amount of solutes present in a unit volume of solution. The concentration of solutes in a solution are key to their ability to produce physiological actions. The concentration of solute in a solution can then be expressed as the number of grams of the substance present in one liter of solution, gram per liter. Concentrations are expressed based upon the number of solute molecules in solution using a measure of mass called molecular weight. The molecular weight of a molecule is equal to the sum of the atomic masses of all the atoms in the molecule. The concentration of solutes dissolved in the body fluids are much less than one mole per liter. Please look at these computations in the textbook. A molecule that releases protons or hydrogen ions in solution is called an acid. Conversely, 
any substance that accept a hydrogen ion is termed a base. A solution of pH 7 is termed neutral solution. Alkaline solutions have a lower hydrogen ion concentration and there are pH that is greater than 7. Whereas those with greater hydrogen ion concentration has a pH lower than 7 and are considered acidic. Note that as the acidity increases, the pH decreases. As acidity decreases, the pH increases. Um, glucose, which has a chemical formula of C6H12O6, has a molecular weight of 180 grams per molar mass. Uh, this is derived by multiplying the molecular mass and summing this up. One mole of a compound is the amount of the compound in grams equal to its molecular weight. Uh, the other figures shown here are acids, hydrochloric acid uh, usually releases protons. And, and chlorides. Carbonic acid is capable of releasing hydrogen ions forming bicarbonates that can in turn accept hydrogen ions again to form carbonic acid. This particular molecule, carbonic acid and bicarbonates, are often called buffers because they can accept hydrogen ions in acidic environments or they can release hydrogen ions in basic environments. So they are buffers. Lactic acid can also behave in the same way. And they can interconvert between lactic acid and lactate. Now let's move on to the organic macromolecules. Organic macromolecules consist of long chains of carbon and hydrogen called hydrocarbon. Organic refers broadly to compounds that contain chains of carbon atoms that forms the backbone of the molecule. But these molecules may also contain hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, and salts and other elements. Uh, the ability of carbon atoms to form large molecules is based mainly on its ability to bond with four other atoms, such as another carbon or other types of atoms, in varying, and so they can form chains of carbon atoms in varying lengths and configurations. Carbon to carbon combinations introduce the possibility of enormous complexity and variety of molecules. Chemists have identified more than a million organic compounds and we will try to examine the most important organic molecules here. Now although carbon um, atoms make up the backbone of organic molecules, let me reiterate that organic molecules can also contain hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And usually these, uh, these elements or these atoms are combined into small groups called functional groups. Here we have a lauric acid shown here with its long chain of hydrocarbons forming the hydrocarbon chain or the hydrocarbon backbone. And it is attached to a carboxyl, which is the functional group shown here. Functional groups in macromolecules help determine the properties of the organic compound. These functional groups may include hydroxyl, methyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino groups, phosphate, and sulfhydryl. In general, functional groups affect how macromolecules interact with nearby molecules, which in turn determines their behavior or function in the aqueous environment. Functional groups affect the bonds that hold the macromolecules together, 
For example, the hydrogen bonds between nucleotide bases and DNA actually hold the DNA strands together. Functional groups can also affect the polarity of the molecules. The carboxyl groups and hydroxyl groups at the ends and along the hydrocarbons of carbohydrates make them highly soluble molecules in cells, making it easier for them to enter metabolic pathways quickly. Proteins have complex structures caused by interactions between the amino groups. The change of a single amino acid can make a major change in the function of a protein. To drive home the uh, role of functional groups in molecules, I would like to show here the difference between uh, testosterone and estradiol, which are sex hormones. They have the same uh, molecular uh, form. They are made up of four fused rings, but the difference only lies in a methane group, a methyl group that is attached to the testosterone. There is none of this in the estradiol. With just this single functional group that differs, it results to the big difference between a male and a female. Now, the principal types of biological molecules. Although so much diversity of biological molecule is found in the human body, these thousands of molecules in living in living cells may be sorted only into four major classes, namely carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Uh, some organic molecules form when many identical smaller molecules called subunits or monomers are linked together by dehydration synthesis. Each of these uh, major macromolecules have their own uh, monomers. When they are broken down by uh, hydrolysis, they can yield simple uh, monomers or building blocks that can be used for metabolism. Carbohydrates are highly soluble polymers of simple sugars or monosaccharides. They account for 1% of the body weight. There are compounds made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio. An example here that's shown is glucose. Uh, the linear form is shown here on the left and its ring form is shown on the right. They are interchangeable but in aqueous solutions the ring form is often uh, favored at uh, chemical equilibrium. Carbohydrates play a central role in metabolism. In fact, they are the very molecules that are commonly broken down to yield uh, energy for ATP in our cells. Being highly soluble because they contain uh, hydroxyl atoms all throughout. Um, carbohydrates may be classified as either monosaccharides or simple sugars, disaccharides made up of two simple sugars, and polysaccharides made up of a chain of simple sugars. The most common uh, simple sugar or monosaccharide in many animals is glucose, and because they are preponderant in blood, they're often called blood sugar. Uh, other monosaccharides include galactose, which is the simple sugar found in milk, ribose and deoxyribose, which are the sugars that uh, comprise nucleotides of DNA and RNA. Ribose is the sugar in RNA, well as deoxyribose is the sugar component in DNA. Disaccharides are made up of two units of monosaccharides. Sucrose is made up of a glucose and fructose units. Lactose is made up of glucose and a galactose unit, whereas maltose is built up from two glucose monosaccharides. The most common polysaccharide in animal cells or in the human body is 
glycogen. It is a highly branched uh, chain of uh, polysaccharide. Here you have um, a diagram from Wikipedia showing the protein core of glycogen and its uh, radiating uh, polysaccharides. They're often broken down by uh, hydrolysis to yield glucose, which then enters cell metabolism. Lipids are compounds that consist mainly of carbon and hydrogen linked by nonpolar covalent bonds. Being linked together by nonpolar non covalent bonds, they are uh, in turn also characterized to be hydrophobic in varying degrees. Lipids may be classified as either simple lipids, glycerides, complex lipids, or steroids. Uh, you have fatty acids that are shown here as simple lipids. Uh, on the left, you have a saturated fatty acid with all its carbon atoms fully bonded with hydrogen and hydroxyl. And then on the right side, you have a fatty acid that is unsaturated. A couple of its carbon atom is not fully bonded with hydrogen and therefore forms a double bond between each other and, and uh, forms a bend on the hydrocarbon chain. The bend is called kink as well. And this often causes the fatty acid to occupy a larger space among all the other fatty acids, causing the collection of fatty acids much more fluid, especially at room temperature. Um, saturated fatty acids, on the other hand, are usually compactly arranged when they are in a, in a lipid and so are often solid at room temperature. An example would be for the saturated fatty acids it would be butter and for unsaturated fatty acids you, acids, you may have uh, olive oil that stays liquid at room temperature. The glycerides uh, that is shown here is a triglyceride, the common uh, fat uh, molecule that we store in our adipose cells. It's composed of a short alcohol, glycerol, that is bound to three fatty acid tails. Uh, some glycerides can only have two fatty acid tails and so they are called diglyceride. Some have only one fatty acid tail to its bound to its alcohol component. So you have monoglyceride. So depending on the fatty acid, number of fatty acid tails, you can classify glycerides as either monoglyceride, diglyceride, or triglycerides. Um, you have here a complex lipid uh, composed of fatty acids that are attached to um, molecule, small molecules that contains uh, polar or ionic groups of atoms. Here you have a phospholipid that contains a small group of phosphate molecule bonded to two fatty acid chains. Uh, because of these two different uh, components of the complex lipid or phospholipid, the entire molecule exhibits a hydrophilic part which is formed by this phosphate containing uh, group or head and then you have hydrophobic fatty acid chains. So because you have hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts, this molecule is called amphipathic. Amphipathic molecules are structural molecules of plasma membrane of cells. Uh, these phospholipids usually form a double layer, the so-called bilipid layer, wherein the phosphate hydrophilic heads faces the aqueous or watery surfaces of the plasma membrane, that is the interior and exterior uh, sides, and then the hydrophobic fatty acid chains face the inner um, plane of the lipid bilayer, 
where there is very little water. And so they form two layers of phospholipids. Each of the phospholipid heads faces the external and internal environment of the cell plasma membrane. Here you have a steroid made up of pure four fused rings. Steroids are very important structural and functional uh, lipids in cells. A good example of a steroid would be cholesterol, which is not only a precursor of many kinds of steroid uh, hormones, but they also form uh, the, one of the major components of plasma membrane. Because of the larger space that they occupy in the plasma membrane, they also contribute fluidity in the plasma membrane. Um, besides the hormones that makes up the chemical messengers of the human body, uh, steroids can also be precursors to many other kinds of molecules that are important. Icosanoids is another class of chemical messengers in the human body. It's derived from arachidinonic acid, arachidinonic acid, and uh, these uh, icosanoids are very important chemical messengers that can regulate blood pressure or uh, in inflammatory responses that is very important to physiological homeostasis. Some major functions of lipids can be summarized here. Um, lipids can serve as energy reserves like the triglycerides or some of the fatty acids. Uh, chemical messengers are served by steroids and icosanoids. Uh, some lipids are structural like the phospholipid and the steroids that form or cholesterol that form part of the plasma membrane and some of the lipids can also act as natural coatings of waxes and oils. Proteins account for about 50% of the organic material in the body. That's about 17% of the body weight and they have critical functions in almost every physiological and homeostatic process. Um, they are polymers of amino acids composed of a central carbon atom, a hydrogen atom, and a carboxyl group, and then an amino group on this side here, and an R group. The R group is the radical group or the variable side chain of the amino acid. This is the part of the amino acid that distinguishes one amino acid from another. Table 2.6 in our in chapter 2 of our textbook summarizes the uh, various Uh, physiological hom homeostatic processes of which proteins are involved. Proteins are considered to, to be the most abundant and diverse macromolecule in the human cells. But they are made up only of 20 different kinds of amino acids. Usually amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds by dehydration synthesis to form uh, chains of amino acids or polypeptides. Um, you have a table here showing the various amino acids, uh, some of which are nonpolar, some are polar, some are electrically charged, either as acidic or basic amino acids. Now, Proteins can serve many functions. As we have mentioned, they are very diverse. Some proteins act as enzymes, such as salivary amylase. Uh, some are structural proteins, like plasma membrane proteins and keratin. Some are transport proteins, like hemoglobin, 
that is used to shuttle oxygen and carbon dioxide across the bloodstream. You have storage proteins like myoglobin that stores uh, oxygen in muscle cells. Some proteins are contractile like mycin and actin in muscle cells. Some proteins also act as antibodies or melanin as defense proteins. And lastly, some proteins are signal proteins that serve as hormones. Proteins are being very complex, may be described in four major ways. The primary structure that is mainly made up of the sequence of amino acids forming the polypeptide secondary structure which is uh, usually formed by the coiling and folding of the amino acids due to hydrogen bonding between uh, non-adjacent amino acids and then you have tertiary structure which is the overall shape of the polypeptide that forms a globular uh, structure and then finally you have quaternary structures many of the Proteins are actually made up of a combination of two or more polypeptides that are already at tertiary structure. A good example would be hemoglobin, which is made up of four uh, tertiary structure proteins. Uh, this figure here shows the various structures, levels of structures. The primary structure, which is which refers mainly to the sequence of amino acids in the chain of protein or polypeptide. And then you have the secondary structure, which is uh, caused by hydrogen bonding between nearby amino acids, forming alpha helical and pleated beta sheet uh, configurations of the protein. And then you have the tertiary structure, which is an overall shape of coiled and looped and bended uh, polypeptide due to um, various um, chemical bonds, especially hydrogen and uh, covalent bonds between non-adjacent amino acids. And then finally, you have the quaternary structure, which is a combination of different polypeptides at tertiary structure that's combined together. So you have quaternary structure. Here you have the quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Uh, this is the normal hemoglobin and the sickle cell hemoglobin. Okay, um, alterations of primary structure is called mutation. When an amino acid of valine is replaced by amino acid glutamate in the beta change of hemoglobin, the result of this change is a serious disease called sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. The mutation points is shown in, the, in this ribbon model of normal and sickle cell forms of hemoglobin. If someone has sickle cell disease, the red blood cells become hard and sticky and look like C-shaped farm tools called sickle. And the sickle cells usually die early and causes constant shortage of red blood cells. So you have anemia. It's a very painful uh, disease as well because uh, the red blood cells usually uh, gets obstructed in their flow in the veins and in other blood vessels that produces so much pain. In sickle cell hemoglobin, the glutamate uh, amino acids are mutated and replaced by valine. This causes the entire uh, hemoglobin molecule to be unable to maintain its configuration and can cause uh, change in the cell shape of the red blood cells themselves so that their flow in the bloodstream is highly irregular and often obstructed. Just by a change of amino acid, 
you have a change in the function of the entire complex protein molecule. Nucleic acids account for about 2% of the body weight. Yet these molecules are extremely important because they are responsible for the storage, expression, and transmission of genetic information. There are two classes of nucleic acids, the DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA or ribonucleic acid. DNA molecules store genetic information coded in three nucleotide base sequences, whereas RNA molecules are involved in decoding the genetic code into sequences of amino acids to form the polypeptide chain product or the protein product. The monomer of nucleic acids is the nucleotide shown here. It's composed of a pentose sugar and a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. The sugar component of DNA is deoxyribose, deoxyribose whereas in RNA it's uh, ribose. The nucleotide bases are in two classes, the purine bases consisting of adenine and uh, guanine, which have double rings of nitrogen bases and carbon atoms. And secondly, you have the pyrimidine bases made up of cytosine thymine, which have only single rings. DNA is formed by two intertwining nucleic acids. Their nitrogenous base held together by hydrogen bonds. RNA is single-stranded nucleic acid, but the linear polynucleotide can uh, bend into loops forming clover-shaped molecule due to hydrogen bonding at distant nucleotides. Uh, in DNA, the nucleotides are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. In RNA, uh, the nucleotides are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. Uracil replaces thymine in RNA. The figure here shows the single strand of a nucleic acid with phosphate and sugar uh, forming the base or the backbone of the nucleic acid. Usually the sugar of one nucleotide is bound in covalent bond to a phos the phosphate of another nucleotide. So you have sugar phosphate uh, backbone. And the nitrogenous bases project on the sides. Here you have a DNA figure with their sugar phosphate backbone forming the uh, the railings of what may look like a staircase and then the uh, nitrogenous bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. Prior to cell division, the DNA in chromosomes is uh, doubled in preparation for their segre segregation in daughter cells when the parent cell splits into two. Each of the two strands is used as a template for synthesizing new DNA. And at the end of DNA replication, each resulting DNA will have both old and new copies of the DNA strand, and which is often described as a semi-conservative uh, state of replication. For your assignment, you answer the following questions that is shown here. Just uh, press the pause controls so that you can copy these questions for you to answer in short sized uh, bond typewritten and in PDF copies. Thank you.